Good afternoon. I'm Raleigh Flynn. I'm the president of the Foreign Policy Research Institute, a nonpartisan think tank based in Philadelphia. This afternoon, our Asia program director, Jacques Delisle, and his co-author, Avery Goldstein, will be discussing their new book, After Engagement, uh, which assesses Chinese capabilities, considers potential risks to international security, and shifting international distribution of power. Um, Jacques, who, whom many of you know, as I mentioned, is the director of our Asia program. He's also the Stephen A. Cussum Professor of Law, Professor of Political Science, and Director of the Center for the Study of Contemporary China at the University of Pennsylvania. His next book, Taiwan Under Sai, uh, his other next book, in, uh, in addition to this one, uh, was co-edited with June Teufel Dreyer and is forthcoming this spring. And in fact, I am also going to announce that on Tuesday, May 4th, from 2 to 3 p.m., uh, Jacques is going to be back discussing this new book. Um, so please, please tune in. That's Tuesday, May 4th, from 2 to 3 p.m. Um, I'd also like to put a plug in. We have a Partners Only event tomorrow, um, tomorrow afternoon with our Robert Strauss who pay fellow or chair in geopolitics, Robert D. Kaplan, the best-selling author, who's going to be giving a off the record um, trip report. He just got back from Egypt. It's, it, uh, it promises to be really interesting. And uh, so if, if you're not a partner, this is the time to consider becoming one. Uh, if you're watching this event and, and you're not a member, uh, I would also say, please, please do consider joining us. We provide an excellent uh, variety of articles, publications, and events. And while they're free to you, they are not free to us. So please, please do your part. And also say thank you to those who have already done their part and who uh, provided generous donations to keep us doing what we do. Um, before we get started, it also give you a reminder, if you have questions, put them in the Q&A box. Um, so without further ado, I will turn it over to Jacques Delisle. Well, thank you, Raleigh, and thank you everyone for joining us. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be here today to uh, plug the book. Uh, there's a picture of it. You can see the information in the in the chat. Uh, I want to just give a brief introduction to my partner in crime here, uh, Avery Goldstein. Uh, Avery is the David M. Knott Professor of Global Politics and International Relations at Penn. He was also my predecessor as the director of the Center for the Study of Contemporary China and my predecessor as the director of the Asia Program uh, here at the Foreign Policy Research Institute. So I've been following Avery for quite some time. Uh, he's also the associate director of the Christopher H. Brown Center for International Politics at the University of Pennsylvania. Uh, and this uh, book is the latest in the series of uh, books produced by our Center for the Study of Contemporary China annual conference. Uh, this one's on a big topic. It's on uh, after engagement security issue or dilemmas in US-China security relations. Uh, and what we're going to do today is to try to give you a brief overview of what the book uh, has to say. We'll just make some framing remarks uh, about themes that we think uh, run through this area of issues as well as uh, through the book itself, and then give you a brief overview of some of the contents. So let me turn it over to Avery to start that rolling. We'll be uh, going back and forth. And again, please put your questions in the Q&A function, and we'll take those up uh, a bit later in our program today. Avery? Hey, thanks, Jacques. Um, so in terms of these framing remarks, let me uh, just give you a flavor as to of the, the book's introduction, but also kind of the origins of the project. Uh, when Jacques and I were thinking about the conference and the, the book that would emerge from it, uh, we were struck, this was probably 2017, 2018, by uh, the change, the dramatic change in US-China relations and the recognition that the era of engagement uh, had not only come to an end, but there was no going back to engagement, regardless of uh, the future of American domestic uh, politics, the next presidential election cycle. Uh, and so we were going to try to examine what the, caused the change in terms of U.S.-China relations and also what was likely to follow in this era, as the book title says, after engagement. Uh, because it was clear that this period of engagement in U.S.-China relations that we've become quite accustomed to uh, really had gone on for some two decades after the end of the Cold War. So for the 1990s and the 2000s, it was a period of um, really a combination of competition uh, and cooperation between the United States and China. But really by about 2010, there was a drift towards greater rivalry between the United States and China. And by the uh, mid-teens of the 21st century, it was clear that this rivalry might even be drifting in the direction of adversarial antagonism between the US and China. 
It was also clear that in retrospect, now that we could see engagement going by the boards, uh, that in fact, the forces that had reshaped the relationship were already in play at the turn of the century. Uh, that when President uh, George W. Bush was elected in 2000, that he came into office with every intention of moving US-China relations in a different direction, a direction of greater rivalry, to move away from the Clinton administration's uh, focus on so-called building a strategic partnership with China uh, and views, viewing China instead as a strategic competitor. But of course, on September 11, 2001, that all changes. And so what I think uh, we understood was happening was uh, at that time, the American attention shifted to the so-called global war on terrorism. Uh, and the uh, United States was not really paying close attention uh, to the Asia Pacific region, or at least it could not be the United States strategic priority uh, for about a decade. But as the US began to uh, draw down its uh, efforts in the global war on terrorism, especially its operations in Afghanistan and Iraq and elsewhere in the Middle East, had returned its attention uh, to the Asia Pacific during the first term under President Obama, uh, it was clear things had changed dramatically. China had in the intervening decade become much wealthier, uh, much more powerful, and was more actively asserting its interests in Asia and elsewhere. Uh, and this triggered American concern about uh, where this was all leading. And it led the Obama administration to initiate or roll out its so-called strategic rebalance, sometimes called the pivot in about 2011. Uh, and it led the US and China in reaction to both begin to view one another more as rivals than partners. Uh, and this acceleration or this deepening of the rivalry between the two countries uh, intensified uh, in the context of the 2016 American uh, election campaign, uh, the election of uh, Donald Trump as president, uh, and events during the Trump administration seemed to be uh, moving the relationship even further in the direction of antagonism where the two countries would see one another not just as rivals, but as potential adversaries. And so this book was designed, the conference was designed to discuss, and then the papers and the book chapters were designed to uh, touch on various aspects of this new rivalry that was uh, uh, following the era of engagement in US-China relations. And so the chapter that uh, Jacques and I co-authored, the introdu uh, introductory chapter, uh, really provides this broad framework, examines some of the underlying influences uh, reshaping US-China relations, in the 21st century. Uh, and I'm going to talk about a couple of international influences, and then Jacques is gonna talk about some of the uh, domestic political uh, causes that were reshaping US-China relations in both China and the United States. So let me just mention two of these uh, contexts for international relations in which the US and China were interacting in the uh, first two decades of the 21st century uh, that was changing. Uh, the first thing really wasn't so much a change uh, as it was a uh, the, the significance of this uh, international context mattered more as China became wealthier and more powerful. Uh, and that is the uh, enduring framework within which all international politics takes place, the so-called context of international anarchy, the absence of any government that stands above the various uh, states in the international system to resolve their disputes, which means that every country has to uh, worry about the intentions of other states that could uh, threaten their own, their vital interests. Uh, especially as states uh, look more able to uh, threaten those interests if they decide to. Uh, and this explained a lot of the increasing concern in the United States and in China about one another's military and economic capabilities and how their own interests might be compromised by the uh, wealth and power of the other. Uh, and that has in some ways driven the disengagement of the United States and China over the past decade or so, uh, what some people now refer to as a process of decoupling as both countries grew increasingly concerned about the vulnerabilities that they uh, felt as a consequence of the deep interdependence that had developed during the era of engagement. Uh, the United States, as I think most of you know, began to become concerned about not just the benefits, but the risks of uh, Chinese investment in the United States, uh, US trade with China, uh, even academic exchanges with China, and the ways in which this kind of interdependent relationship might be contributing to China's growing wealth and power in ways that could uh, put US interests at risk in the future. And China for its part also worried about its vulnerabilities that reflected this interdependent relationship, uh, especially China's concerns were growing about its dependence on uh, American technologies, critical technologies uh, in certain sectors that would be crucial for China's continuing rise, its economic and military modernization. Uh, and so this uncertainty in the context of international anarchy, uh, really as China becomes a more capable actor, 
uh, really explain some of the, uh, the trends that were playing out over the first couple of decades of the 21st century, uh, trends that undoubtedly were accelerated by the fact that China was led by a different sort of leader under Xi Jinping, and the United States had a, a distinctive sort of presidential leadership under uh, Donald Trump. Uh, but you know, what I'm focusing on is, uh, is the context, the broader situation, and not just uh, the individuals. Uh, the second broad um, feature of the international context reshaping the relationship is linked to what I just had to say about China's rise. And that was the, the changing, what IR scholars would call the distribution of capabilities in the international system. Uh, this was kind of seen on the horizon at the turn of the century, but became quite clear by about uh, 2010 uh, that uh, not only were the United States and China two countries who were capable enough that if they had conflicts of interest, they could uh, in fact act on their own interests in ways that would perhaps jeopardize that of the other side, but that these were two countries that were becoming clearly set apart from all the other major powers in the world in terms of their capabilities. There was developing a big gap, and there is in fact a big gap after 2010, uh, between the military power and the economic wealth of the United States, uh, greater than China, and China, and all the rest. Uh, the, the other countries, numbers three, four, and five, six in the international system, Japan, Germany, India, France, Britain, Russia, you name it, that the gap between China as number two and all the rest uh, was growing and growing rapidly. So that the US and China are set apart as these two great powers in the international system. Uh, and we know that in an international system where you have uh, not many great powers or you know, more than two great powers, but just two great powers, there's a tendency for them to focus very closely on one another, to constantly monitor the gains and losses in their relationship, to engage in what some people call zero-sum thinking, and to worry that any gain for the other side, for the other country, is inevitably going to be a loss uh, for your own. And so this contributes to the, the quickening of the rivalry between the United States and China, uh, not just in economics and military affairs, but almost any uh, sphere of their aspect of their relationship, uh, and in fact, in almost every part of the globe, that the United States grew increasingly worried about China's role in Africa, uh, in Latin America, uh, even in, in the Arctic region. Uh, and China, for its part, reacts to the American reaction uh, as uh, an effort by the United States to prevent China, from now wealthier, more powerful, from playing its rightful role in international politics. Uh, and you can see this tendency in a system of these two powers set apart from all the others, uh, at least for the United States, to focus increasingly on China as a policy concern that drives many aspects of American domestic and foreign policy. You know, in the Trump years, it was President Trump's famous uh, mantra, China, China, China. Uh, but if you watched President Biden's speech yesterday, or if you watched any of the hearings for his cabinet nominees and others in the Biden administration, they have been framing almost every foreign and domestic policy initiative they're talking about as something that is necessary for the United States to do to cope with the competition they see, the intense competition they see uh, coming from China. Uh, and uh, as President Biden put it yesterday or last night, uh, that this uh, that attending to these kinds of various aspects of US-China competition would be necessary if the United States was to, as he put it, uh, win the 21st century. Uh, so I'll leave my comments there and allow Jacques to say something about domestic politics in the US and China. Uh, thanks, Avery. So uh, Avery's covered a lot of, of the ground here about what's essentially happened to transform uh, the US-China relationship. I'm going to loop back to a few of the economic issues and then uh, talk about politics and ideology. So on the economic side, as Avery, I think, captured quite nicely, there was a revisiting of interdependence and its costs, the, the, the risk that economic dependence uh, makes one politically and uh, politically vulnerable and vulnerable in a security sense. But part of what drove that was a real mismatch between domestic system types. So if you look at, at much of what's gone on in the US-China relationship, uh, the hope in the early days uh, following the normalization of relations, the opening of economic ties in the late 1970s, really up until well into the 2000s, was this sense that the two systems could to some degree converge, that engaging China in international trade and investment uh, through uh, US, money, U.S. investment flowing into China, through China developing its own industries where it had comparative advantages to export to the U.S. and others, uh, that this would uh, be kind of a win-win uh, type relationship. And the hope was that it would transform China, at least into being a supporter 
of a rules-based international order centered uh, by the late 1990s on the WTO in the trade sector, but, but really across the board. Uh, and the, the, the China would then sort of buy into the status quo, be socialized into those norms, and on more ambitious views would transform uh, domestically into, in the economic sector, at least to a much more market-oriented economy. Uh, but that didn't really happen. Uh, and that really sort of became the complaint. So if you go all the way back, really through many decades when the relationship was basically good, especially on the economic side, there was frustration from the U.S. side about uh, the pace and degree of marketization of the Chinese economy, market access for U.S. exporters and would-be U.S. investors and producers and service providers inside China, poor protection of intellectual property rights of U.S. and other foreign companies, uh, neo-mercantilist uh, trade policies that, that didn't play fully by uh, the core liberal premises of the, of the GATT and then the WTO. Uh, currency manipulation was a charge for a time. Industrial policy and a sort of statist approach to economics that favored uh, state-linked uh, and, and national firms on the Chinese side and commercial espionage uh, and so on. Uh, so these were all long-standing complaints, and they merged with complaints that opening to China economically was having uh, adverse impacts, at least on some parts uh, of the U.S. economy. And uh, so that, that led to a, a sort of revisiting of the happy story uh, as those complaints escalated. And so by the time we get to the period Avery was focusing on, which is the late 2000s and into the 2010s, into our current decade, there had been this major rethink. Some of it was this securitization of economic issues, the sense that uh, the dependence brought uh, vulnerability. Uh, but some of it was just the old critiques. The old complaints were always there, everything I just listed. And layered on top of that were a sense that uh, was a sense that we were engaged in a kind of uh, rivalry among two different approaches uh, to how to run an economy and to how to engage the international economy. So by the time you get into the Obama years, uh, the idea of engage China through the WTO and China will change and it will all be good, uh, which was essentially the Clinton era selling point for, for bringing China into these institutions. By the Obama era, we had the Trans-Pacific Partnership, which in many ways continued the WTO agenda of liberalization and expected to at some point perhaps bring China into it, but it was framed as a rivalrous undertaking. Uh, the TPP was framed, the Trans-Pacific Partnership was framed as a contest between the U.S. and China over who would write the rules for the world economy of the 21st century. Uh, the U.S. Beef, beefed up CFIUS Review, Committee on Foreign Investment in the United States, uh, that, that scrutinizes inbound investment primarily from China. And the U.S. was wary of Chinese-led initiatives like the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank, the New Development Bank, and the Belt and Road Initiative. At the same time, uh, as Avery touched upon, a lot of these economic issues became securitized. And so what were once primarily economic complaints were now entangled with security concerns. Concerns about cyber warfare, uh, which could uh, impact uh, economic functioning. You know, you take down the grid, you interfere with uh, computer systems, uh, hacks and things of that ilk. The growing U.S. concern with dual-use technology, that what China was acquiring licitly or illicitly from the United States had military applications. This became more serious uh, as China, uh, increasingly under Xi Jinping, they began to talk about civil-military fusion, blurring the line between uh, economic and, and security issues. Uh, and a sense that China's industrial policy was focused on closing the technological gap with the United States, something which has national economic security and national security implications. This, of course, got compounded with COVID-19 when the uh, potentially serious uh, societal and security consequences of being dependent for PPE or drug inputs or test kit components uh, became quite clear. And as some in the U.S. charged China was targeting uh, its, its aid and its sales on a political basis, and as the U.S. under Trump sort of retaliated and threatening to uh, shut off uh, exports or to monopolize the supply of certain COVID-related drugs. Um, over the, the recent years, we also have seen beefing up of CFIUS further with FIRMA, the Foreign Investment Risk Review um, uh, Monitoring Act, uh, which was designed to toughen scrutiny and it was targeted largely on China. And certainly in the Trump years, we saw uh, the emergence of the so-called trade war, uh, the focus on China's industrial policy, including Made in China 2025 and the innovation economy, which were to help China close that gap, and then targeted measures uh, adopted by the United States to potentially really hurt China. So the potential ban on chips uh, uh, being sold to ZTE, a major Chinese telecoms production firm, the uh, placing of Huawei and other entities on the entities list, barring them from U.S. contracting, uh, and things of that ilk, uh, targeting TikTok and WeChat to keep them out of the U.S. market, and keeping Chinese scholars and students uh, out of STEM fields. All this was seen by China as a quite assertive and aggressive attempt to keep China down. 
Uh, and there was this uh, growth of real mutual mistrust. Uh, how, how high were the U.S. demands going to be? Uh, would the U.S. Uh, under, under Trump follow through on any um, on, on any uh, trade pact that was reached, the phase one trade deal and so on. And you see China engaged in uh, new policies like the so-called dual circulation policy, which relies more on domestic demand and technological self-sufficiency. And as Avery noted, this has continued beyond the Trump era. Uh, we see under Biden this build back better, the supply chain security, um, the uh, inclusion of China elements in virtually every policy, including the Amer American jobs plan and so on. So that's a big part of the story. I'll touch briefly on a couple of others. One is the ideational conflict. Uh, so, you know, way back in the old days, of course, the U.S. and China were on opposite sides of a big ideological divide. The Nixon change was to make uh, ideology irrelevant in an alliance of security convenience. But really, during the long period from uh, the normalization of relations in 79 until uh, late in the aughts, uh, we had the era of, of constructive engagement and what international relations theorists would call constructivism. The idea that engaging China, bringing it into the uh, international system, would uh, at least change China's international behavior. And on the most um, extreme versions, which have been really caricatured in recent years, it would change China domestically. It would make it a more democratic or at least more liberal system. This, these ideas came up in the heyday of the so-called democratic peace uh, theory. The idea that a nation's, the benign version of the idea that a nation's domestic politics determine its international behavior. So if China could become more democratic, more benign at home, it would become more benign abroad. By the time you get into the 2010s, that idea is basically gone in U.S. policy circles. Uh, anyone who wants to push constructive engagement doesn't get much of a hearing in Washington uh, these days. And uh, the sense was that this had failed and that China was, in fact, uh, increasingly assertively undermining a liberal rules-based international order. Uh, domestically in China, politics, especially in the Xi Jinping era, but also beginning uh, before him in the late Hu Jintao years, had gone more authoritarian at home. And this authoritarian approach to politics was being at least uh, contemplated as an export product. Uh, so certainly rejecting uh, ongoing U.S. efforts to try to change China, uh, a lot of the uh, liberal human rights rule of law ideas faced an increasing pushback from China as an attempt to peacefully evolve China, to interfere in China's internal affairs and as ideas that were simply unsuited to China. At time as China became uh, more self-confident, more uh, rich and powerful, we started to hear more about the idea of exporting a Chinese model. It had lessons to teach others, and there were concerns in the U.S. that the BRI, Belt and Road Initiative, and other things would be mechanisms for doing that. And this happens at a time when the U.S. self-confidence of post-Cold War triumphalism was starting to, uh, to come apart a bit. This, of course, reached a much higher level during the Trump administration when we had Mike Pence giving a speech about the whole of government, whole of society conflict between the U.S. and China, framing China along with Russia as an ideological rival, uh, Pompeo framing uh, the COVID response issue as a contest between democracies and authoritarian regimes, and trotting out the free and open Indo-Pacific as not just a security concept, but an alliance of democracy. None of these ideas were new, but they took a big step up under Trump, and they've persisted under Biden. The Biden administration has continued on uh, the notion of an alliance of democracies in the Asia Pacific and the Indo-Pacific, and has affirmed even the, the declaration that what China is doing in Xinjiang uh, is genocide. And we saw this you know, reaching uh, a quite dramatic point during the Alaska meetings uh, between uh, Wang Yi, Yang Jiechi on the Chinese side, and Tony Blinken and Jake Sullivan on the U.S. side, where basically China said, you don't have the credentials to speak for universal values and lecture to China and others about how they should be. And the U.S. says, sure, we will. These are universal values. And China saying, you have no right to interfere in our internal affairs. And the U.S. saying, these are uh, issues of universal uh, concern. So that's very much where we are. Uh, finally, just briefly, on the question of uh, domestic politics, foreign policy does begin at home. And what we've seen is uh, the long period from really, again, the late 1970s until um, several years ago, where China had a, lot, had a fairly good situation in U.S. foreign policy. Uh, and U.S. politics, rather. The idea was the business community was pretty much pro-engagement with China. Uh, presidential candidates of the out-of-power party would beat up on the in-power party for being too soft on China, but it really didn't have great impact in U.S. politics. But as, as we enter the more, most recent period, the last several years, there was a sense that globalization really was hurting some sectors in the United States, and that was easily blamed on China because China was the immediate source of a lot of exports and it was an identifiable target. U.S. business turned sour on China because of the difficulties they were facing in doing business in China, particularly as the statist notion of the economy 
resurged under Xi Jinping, and simply a more powerful and richer China had more economic consequences uh, in the U.S. So we, we saw the election dynamics go into a new phase, uh, particularly in 2016, uh, when Trump beat up not only on past uh, Democratic, that is Obama era policies, but on the whole sweep of U.S. policy under Republican and Democratic presidents toward China. Uh, and we saw a bipartisan consensus emerge in Washington that constructive engagement was dead and we had to be much tougher on China. Even with Biden coming to power, uh, we've seen a critique that is not, and this is in the campaign, a critique that is not so much Trump was insufficiently tough on China or that Trump was too tough on China, we don't see a swing back, but rather that Trump was tough on China in the wrong ways. Too much hysteria, too much racism, too much uh, COVID uh, finger pointing, uh, that we had to be tough and smart. Uh, so the, the bipartisan consensus in Congress has extended from uh, the Trump administration to the Biden administration, which in other ways are very different, but are very much uh, part of the story. China, of course, has its domestic politics too, and with this I'll stop. Uh, it views many of the U.S. policies that Avery and I have been discussing as an attempt to keep China down and to, to delegitimate the CCP at home. Uh, Chinese politicians now trade in nationalism and national strength and pride, such that it's very costly to knuckle under to U.S. pressure. And of course, COVID again amplified uh, the hostility that comes with a lot of that. So I'm going to throw it back to Avery to talk about some of the chapters in the book. Okay, so um, I, I'll talk about some of the chapters and Jacques will talk about some. Uh, I'll, one of the first ones I'll talk about is written by uh, uh, Ian Johnston and it's a chapter that, talk, that examines the security dilemma, this old concept in the study of international relations that states sometimes hedge their bets against what could be security threats they face and that states take actions to enhance their own security but others see that as a potential threat to their security and you get into this kind of uh, cycle. It's a reflection of this dilemma. Johnson chapter looks at this in the context of US-China relations, uh, but takes the concept a step farther, uh, further and uh, argues that in fact, you have to think about the life cycle of a security dilemma. And he says, sometimes security dilemmas take on this life cycle that leads each side to become increasingly convinced that they're not just hedging their bets against uncertainty, but that they become increasingly convinced that the other side has it out for them. That in fact, the other side does pose a threat, that its intentions are malign. Uh, and much of what he discovers when he examines some of the empirical evidence, he, he scours the media reports from China and the way they characterize the relationship, uh, he sees this as something that's going on in US-China relations uh, and that bodes ill for the future as both sides become convinced that there's little uncertainty about the other side's malign intentions. Uh, Jacques, you wanna? Sure, so, as Avery's just alluded to, there are, uh, uh, you know, a couple of ideas kicking around here. One is that, that the security relationship between the U.S. and China, which is you know, not great these days, uh, is partly a security dilemma that is um, uh, the risk of reading the other side's um, behavior as, a, as aggressive or offensive uh, when you yourself see it as defensive or at least you have to hedge against that possibility. That coexists with some arguments that stress more the notion of real conflicts of interest. So uh, Charlie Glazer, Charles Glazer has a chapter in the book which, which argues that much of what goes on in U.S.-China security relations is not a security dilemma but is a true conflict of interest. The U.S. and China just have conflicting national interests uh, on several issues and he ranks them in order of priority. Taiwan, uh, the U.S. structure of alliances in Northeast Asia, the sea lanes of communications in, in the Western Pacific, uh, and the South China Sea, East China Sea disputes. And in, in Glazer's view, the first two of those are really big deal conflicts of interest. Uh, the U.S. and it's a, it's a semi-zero sum game uh, between the, the U.S. and China over whether the U.S. keeps its alliance structure in place and whether, whether Taiwan uh, keeps its current uh, autonomous status. Uh, but here too, there's a little bit of a security dilemma element in that the U.S. and China have different views about what's going on there. Uh, China sort of sees its natural role in Northeast Asia as one that has a diminished role for the U.S. and it's the U.S. that's parked itself on China's doorstep. And China sees Taiwan as a part of China that is essentially trying to get away from China. So China sees these as defensive or status quo supporting moves, whereas the U.S. says we've got an alliance structure in Northeast Asia and Taiwan has been de facto autonomous uh, since 1949. Uh, so China is trying to change the status quo by forcing the U.S. out or by changing uh, the, the degree of autonomy Taiwan enjoys. So there's this sort of risk of escalation. The other two issues, the sea lanes and the South China and East China Sea issues, Glazer thinks are more ideational. Where are we on principles of freedom of navigation and things like that? Um, and uh, an area where there's room for splitting the loaf, compromising 
uh, and so on. His advice is that the U.S. probably should yield a little on some of these issues that are more important to China and should be wary of over-interpreting Chinese assertiveness. Uh, uh, the, the next part of the book has a series of chapters that deal with, uh, take a geographic focus, examine aspects of U.S.-China relations that involve relations with, with third parties or other states in the region. Uh, I'll talk about two of them and I'll leave uh, two others to Jacques. Uh, one is a chapter by uh, Taylor Fravel and Casey Mura, uh, and they examine the South China Sea, uh, obviously in the news quite a bit over the past decade, uh, but they describe the growing uh, security competition between the United States and China in the South China Sea, uh, and see it really taking off in about 2012 in the context of the standoff between China and the Philippines over Scarborough Shoal. Uh, and what Fravel and Mura conclude is that what began in the South China Sea as a regional conflict among rival local claimants to territory uh, and associated maritime rights in the South China Sea emerged and became a key focal point for U.S.-China rivalry, and that it was really not just about the South China Sea for the U.S. and China, but rather that it was seen as a proxy or it came to, to represent something larger, uh, that it was seen as revealing something about the intentions of the United States if you're sitting in Beijing, or something about uh, uh, the intentions of China if you're sitting in Washington, and the American perspective was this action in the South China Sea and China's more assertive behavior there demonstrated that China may well be a revisionist power that wants to use its wealth uh, and military might to challenge the existing rules-based international order. Uh, and that for China, this uh, interaction in the South China Sea uh, was a reflection of the American interest, as Jacques put it before, in containing China, keeping it down, uh, denying its uh, rightful role in the region and on the world stage. Uh, the other geographically focused chapter that I'll mention is one by Victor Cha in Georgetown uh, about U.S.-China competition on the Korean Peninsula or the way it shapes uh, uh, China's and America's re uh, relations with the two regimes on the Korean Peninsula. Uh, he looks at South Korea and he uh, tries to figure out how South Korea and the government in Seoul has dealt with the fact that it looks to the United States for its security, uh, but it has a very close and significant economic relationship with China that means it doesn't want to antagonize China. Uh, and he talks about the ways in which South Korea has straddled these two concerns and forged a policy that involved some degree of, of hedging, if you will, but that over time, as US-China tensions have built, especially in the last five years, this hedging is becoming more difficult for South Korea. Uh, and intriguingly, Cha sees the possibility that in fact, South Korea is beginning to tilt a little more towards China as the U.S.-China competition intensifies, and he expects this to cause increase, growing stress in U.S.-China, uh, the, in the U.S. Excuse me, in the U.S.-South Korea alliance. Uh, he also talks a bit about the uh, more opaque and mysterious North Korean regime and the way uh, U.S.-China rivalry has uh, shaped, reshaped, and continues to shape uh, uh, Pyongyang's view about uh, serving its own interests in the region. Uh, Pyongyang, North Korean regime, obviously wants to. Uh, lean on China for a degree of its security, and it wants to strengthen its ties to Beijing, and so it backs China when uh, China has issues with the United States and their great power rivalry. Uh, but uh, he points out that China also worries that North Korea, at various moments in the past decade or so, has at times seemed as though they wanted to cut a deal with the United States. And so in some respects, uh, China has leverage because uh, excuse me, North Korea has leverage because China's concerned that in fact, warming US North Korean ties uh, could well uh, thwart China's ambitions on the Korean Peninsula. Uh, then there's two other geographically focused chapters, uh, Josh. Sure, so we've got one on Japan and one on Taiwan. Mike Green's chapter on Japan, uh, where he basically argues that uh, Japan has pressed the United States to be tougher on China in recent years. Uh, but that Japan also can exercise a somewhat restraining function uh, if the U.S. Uh, wanders into or, or stumbles or escalates into needless conflicts with China. Uh, as he characterized it, Japan's position in the U.S.-China relationship was for many years, for many decades, characterized by essentially an alliance dilemma. That is, Japan has had to worry about dependence on the U.S. for security in two ways. One is if a U.S.-China conflict emerged, Japan would be dragged into it, be entrapped uh, into backing the U.S. side, even if it did not serve Japanese interests. And Japan at the same time had to worry that the U.S. might abandon Japan to China if the U.S. didn't think uh, Japan's interests were worth fight fighting for or bearing the costs uh, that would be incurred in a uh, conflict with China. Uh, in the 2010s, Green argues, things have shifted a bit. And as China became more aggressive, particularly in the, or more assertive, particularly in the East China Sea, 
Uh, and as Japan began to worry, like many other countries, about the possible political uses of China's growing economic leverage, uh, Japan leaned a bit more toward the U.S. And as U.S.-China rivalry increased, uh, that created opportunities uh, for Japan to get stronger backing uh, from the U.S. in friction uh, with China. Um, and so although uh, Japan chafed some at Donald Trump's trade agenda and at his uh, questioning of traditional U.S.-China alliances, Japan, at least under Abe, uh, managed uh, to uh, handle the U.S. relationship uh, pretty well and scored successes on several fronts in cooperating with the U.S., including on the diplomatic front of the free and open Indo-Pacific idea, which actually kind of originated with Japan, on the ideational front as democratic solidarity, on the military front with closer ties, and on the economic front uh, with uh, technological uh, you know, approaches to Huawei and things like that that dovetailed with the U.S. and criticism of the Belt and Road Initiative. But at the same time, Japan has hedged. Uh, Abe uh, trimmed back toward uh, re-improving the rather battered relationships between Japan and China. The succession from Abe to Suga and from Trump to Biden uh, really, in many ways, just makes this pattern a little easier to sustain. Uh, Scott Kastner uh, writes about the Taiwan issue, and his view is that a U.S.-China conflict over Taiwan is a relatively low probability event, but if it occurs, it's a real big problem, uh, so we do have to worry about it. Uh, his argument is that as the cross-strait military balance increasingly shifts in China's favor, uh, China uh, is likely to be more willing to use force if Taiwan is not willing to make concessions because it can do so with relatively low cost, and Taiwan has corresponding reasons to be more accommodating toward China. The problem, however, is that that may not happen. Uh, in part because Taiwan's domestic politics make it very difficult to, for any Taiwanese leader to make concessions to China. And uh, there are risks of misperception with each side overstating its own resolve and having the other side be skeptical about that resolve and the risk that either side will misread the other's red line, uh, any side in what's essentially a triangular relationship with the US, China, and Taiwan. Uh, and the problem that China cannot make very credible commitments to Taiwan about how it will behave in a post-concession uh, moment. This creates difficulties for U.S. policy trying to deter China without risking entrapment by Taiwan, that is Taiwan being adventurous and drawing the U.S. into a conflict that it doesn't want. And the U.S. must make its assurances to Taiwan and its deterrence of China without some of the usual tools of a formal alliance relationship or stationing troops uh, in the allies, the allies' territory. And Kastner basically agrees with Glazer that there's a security dilemma type element here, which is uh, each side, the U.S. and China, uh, views itself as supporting the status quo uh, and the other is trying to change the status quo. Then the last chunk of the book looks to issue areas rather than uh, geography. Uh, and here there are again three chapters. I'll say something briefly about Phil Saunders, uh, who writes on the mil military issues, and military dilemmas for China. Uh, and basically his story is that China has invested a great deal in increasing its military capacity, which has given a greater ability to pursue its foreign policy goals. But this has a kind of backfiring effect or a perverse consequence in that China's growing uh, capacities have made the U.S. and China's neighbors more wary of China's capacities and its possible uh, assertive agenda. Uh, and that uh, nonetheless, with expanded capacities, China still uh, is lagging the uh, ability to, to protect its even more fast-growing, far-flung interests, its economic interests around the world, its nationals being stationed far abroad, and so on. Sanders predicts that there are five factors that will determine the trajectory of uh, People's Liberation Army modernization and U.S.-China security relations. They are the regional security environment, uh, whether there is any domestic instability in China that the PLA might have to cope with, uh, the economic performance of China, which provides the resources for military modernization, and China's uh, external interests. How fast do they rise? How does China see the need to protect them? And finally, and most importantly, U.S.-China relations, uh, which if they go bad, can lead China to invest even more in U.S. targeting capacities, and as that happens, increased American distrust, and the spiral continues. Okay, and there's two more chapters in this last section of the book, and I'll be mercifully brief so that we have plenty of time to uh, get involved with the questions that uh, people have been posing. Uh, the chapter by uh, Elsa Kania and Adam Siegel looks at the technological or really science and technology aspect of U.S.-China relations and rivalry uh, as this great power competition, as the phrase goes, has taken root. Uh, examines uh, China's determination, as we stated before in this talk, to become more self-reliant in key sectors of science and technology, to reduce its dependence on what they are increasingly see as an American partner that's now unreliable, potentially hostile to China, uh, and the United States' interest in uh, preserving its role as the uh, preeminent global leader in science and technology 
in the face of this new challenge that China could pose uh, to that role the United States has played ever since World War II. Uh, having staked out kind of the traditional position on science and technology and the concerns of both sides, uh, Kania and Siegel are skeptical, more skeptical than many, that these kinds of uh, interests and in uh, concerns in the US and China will portend a full-blown decoupling of US-China ties in the science and technology realm, uh, that there'll be emergence, a uh, division of the world into distinct science and technology ecospheres. And instead they expect a mixed relationship to continue. Uh, yes, there'll be tension, there'll be cooperation, there'll be competition, uh, but there will be a relationship that continues even if it's characterized by mutual suspicion in the United States and China, that's gonna pose certain challenges for the ways in which scholarly and commercial connections are managed. Uh, and the final chapter in the book is by James Riley, and it looks at China's Belt and Road Initiative, which was launched in 2013, originally uh, translated into English as One Belt, One Road. Uh, and uh, Riley's take on this, and he's one of the first to, to adopt this perspective, was that uh, part of the problem here is that people took China's Belt and Road Initiative at face value. They, they, they bought the Chinese propaganda line in some sense, uh, that the United States uh, believed that the Belt and Road Initiative was in fact a part of a global strategy that China had, an economic strategy, uh, that they would deploy uh, debts as part of debt trap diplomacy and investing in the developing world in a way to advance Beijing's interests, uh, would undermine the security and sovereignty of host states that had Chinese investments as part of the BRI, and ultimately this would harm American interests in various parts of the world. Uh, Riley argues in his chapter that in fact, uh, the, the United States misunderstood what the Belt and Road Initiative was in practice, it was not so much a coherent grand strategy, but instead simply a label that China applied to the vast number of uncoordinated Chinese overseas investment activities that had been, uh, been in place really since early in the 21st century. Uh, he also emphasizes the way in which the Belt and Road Initiative, uh, as these investments grew rapidly under Xi Jinping's leadership, um, ran into trouble. And in fact, such trouble that the Chinese had begun to work on figuring out ways to scale back the ambition of China's foreign investments under the BRI and to change some of its practices to avoid some of the uh, environmental uh, consequences that are leading to blowback for China in various parts of the world. Uh, but Riley also argues it's gonna be very difficult for China to reform the Belt and Road Initiative. In other words, rather than being a, a big advance for China, it's just gonna be a big problem for China's international relations because those many actors who benefited from the attention lavished on the Belt and Road, if you could get your project uh, labeled as part of the Belt and Road, Road, now have a vested interest in seeing the projects continue. And it's gonna be hard for China to, to rein them back in. Uh, Riley concludes by saying that the unfortunate thing about this whole experience is that the American overreaction and misunderstanding of what the Belt and Road Initiative was uh, probably not only added another element of conflict to US-China relations, uh, but may have made it uh, impossible to do what would have been better in terms of global development cha challenges, which is for the United States and China to figure out ways to work together uh, in promoting development parts of the world that have been left behind by the uh, recent decades of globalization. So those are the chapter summaries. We, we really don't do justice to the, the quality of the work. I, I hope people will buy the book and read those chapters, but I think Jacques, now we're gonna turn it over to the audience for questions. Yeah, well, uh, I encourage audience uh, members to put things in the Q&A function. I realize we're going through this, we skipped over one chapter, which I'm just gonna touch upon briefly, but it's a good one to close on because it builds on some of the themes from the Riley chapter. And I think it rebroadens our frame here. It's a chapter by Jessica Chen Weiss, uh, essentially on US-China uh, ideational competition, if you will. Uh, and uh, the, the her argument is that, uh, that basically the U.S. is you know, pushing liberal democracy and China is pushing autocracy to some degree. And the question is, how do we read this? And uh, she says that, that China is not, at least not yet, engaged in an offensive strategy of spreading its political model of autocracy abroad, nor is China, however, merely passively uh, sitting as a bystander as, as global democracies uh, face the troubles they face in the several, last several years. Instead, she says, really, China's goal is to make the world safe for autocracy, to create a safe space 
case uh, for China to be as it is without undue pressure uh, and constraint from the outside. It doesn't want to be alone. And so she says basically China pursues four strategies for making the world safe for authoritarianism or autocracy. One is to lead by example, being a successful regime of this type. Another is to support fellow authoritarian regimes in the UN and other international fora to create international space for this type of governments. A third is to provide economic and technical, including some rather repressive security technologies, uh, assistance to fellow authoritarian regimes. And a fourth is to try to sell a Chinese narrative abroad that presents a relatively benign picture of China and that pushes back against human rights and other critiques uh, from um, from the U.S. and others. Uh, she thinks the better strategy here is not for the U.S. to engage in a similar ideological escalation, but rather to strengthen its own model at home and not to overread what China is up to in terms of its assertiveness. Uh, so we have some questions in, in the uh, function. There's a cluster at the beginning uh, that essentially go to this from Toby Moffat, former member of Congress, uh, that, that looks to the rare earth issue. Uh, and that obviously has been an issue. One of the complaints or one of the concerns about Chinese behavior has been to embargo or threaten to embargo uh, rare earths, the things that make your cell phone work and a variety of other uh, tech products. Uh, and, and what should the US uh, do about it? And the, the options you know, include trying to become self-sufficient, trying to get third sources. Um, so uh, Avery, do you have thoughts on that? Well, the first thing to say is uh, as just as a, an empirical fact, uh, they're called rare earth uh, metals and whatnot. Uh, in fact, they're not rare at all. They're uh, widely dispersed around the globe. The problem is they're really dirty to mine. The environmental consequences of, of mining rare earths are, are serious. And uh, part of the reason why China has come to dominate these industries is because they've been willing to overlook the environmental uh, consequences of mining these things. So there are rare earth uh, reserves, whatever you want to call it, uh, uh, in the United States. And there are companies that have tried to get, uh, get in on, on the business uh, but it's going to take government subsidies. It's going to take all kinds of environmental waivers, probably, in order to do this. Uh, and the real question there is, uh, is that a better approach for, the, for each country to try to become self-sufficient in these uh, rare earths? Or is it a better approach to try to diversify suppliers and encourage multiple countries uh, to become uh, those who can provide these uh, crucial components, crucial elements to, in the components for electronics? Um, you know, I'm not someone who really knows the technical dimensions to uh, answer that question, other than I think as a political matter, the U.S. is strongly motivated to reduce its dependence on Chinese rare earths. Right. And one of the problems with something like this, of course, is that the startup for operations, and not only their environmental consequences, but it's very costly to start it up. So, you know, we kind of have to, I think, make a more big picture choice about whether we're going to uh, go as far in, in avoiding dependence on China and the risks that come with it that we're willing to subsidize and protect and, and do other things to keep those markets open so that uh, the, the companies will invest in it or, or else we have to make it a government uh, responsibility. Um, so we have another question. Uh, uh, a question about, I think this is from Tom Gold, about uh, what we make of Matt Pottinger, Marathon Initiative, and, and sort of variety of other uh, moves in that space uh, to try to affect uh, where U.S. China's policy, policy is heading, uh, many of them obviously affiliated with the Trump administration and who are now out of power. And you don't want to take that first, do you? Uh, <laughs> Not so really. I, I, without getting into the specifics, because um, you know I, I'm familiar with uh, uh, Matt Pottinger's views and some of his views that he's expressed now that he's out at Stanford. Um, I think there, there's kind of div a divide in, in the, uh, the community of folks that look at U.S.-China relations, look at Chinese foreign and security policy. You have, on the one hand, you have folks, mainly those who are affiliated with the Trump administration, who have concluded that there is uh, no other alternative other than to take a very hard line with China, that uh, rival, not just rivalry, but um, uh, an, an adversarial relationship is locked in. And the point is to prevent China from doing bad things and to try to pressure China wherever possible. Um, and I think that's the view that, that uh, Matt upholds. Uh, the other view among China scholars is, yes, the, there is a real uh, challenge that China poses uh, and that it may well turn out that the relationship becomes increasingly adversarial over time, but that acknowledges that the choices that China is going to make in the coming years will depend on uh, not just what China wants to do, uh, but what the United States chooses to do. In other words, it's the argument that China's uh, choices are in part shaped by what the United States does and that part of what the United States does has to look to China as though it's being offered uh, carrots, as well as being warned with sticks. I, I agree with, with all of that. Um, 
and I would say that, that basically, and what is one of the messages of the book is that uh, engagement, constructive engagement is over and there's a consensus that something else needs to happen, but there's a real dissensus about what that something else should be. And there is this range from the, what one might call the hardline position you're seeing from Pottinger and McMaster and people like that, uh, and people who think it's a more um, a nuanced uh, mix, and, and this is sort of the Blinken position, you know, you compete, you cooperate, and you contend uh, as, as need be. Um, which is, you know, strikes me as surely right, although the devil is in the details about sorting out what that mix is. Uh, and as I think the book also emphasizes, and as Avery underscored in his comments just now, a lot of this stuff is baked in. I mean, a lot of this wouldn't, you know, the, the, the trend lines are there. There are going to be problems in the relationship based on economic and, and geopolitical uh, power shifts and so on. But there is room for agency here, and we can make it better, we can make it worse, and there's a range of views on on how you do that. And of course, the hardline caucus essentially says you're a chump if you cooperate at all. Uh, and then the, this other view, which which I think Gabriel and I both associate ourselves a bit more with, uh, say, yeah, sometimes you have to be, but but you're you're creating um, greater risks and, and needless strife if you're uh, one-sidedly um, uh, thinking the relationship is bad and, and, and irretrievably bad, bad in all facets. Um, okay, we have uh, another question in here uh, about Charlie Glazer. Um, who argued in foreign affairs yesterday, as he argued in some form uh, over the years, uh, that the U.S. should recover, uh, should, should reconsider its commitments in East Asia, differentiate interests, and even give up less important interests such as defending Taiwan to avoid disastrous great power conflict uh, with China. What do we think of that argument? Well, you want me to take this one first, <laughs> Avery? Uh, I actually read the piece yesterday, but you can take it if you want. Well, look, I mean, the, the abandoned Taiwan argument comes up uh, pretty frequently, uh, that it's kind of like locusts, only more frequent, um, and uh, it it never really seems ultimately to gain uh, policy uh, traction. Um, my sense is it's not gaining a lot of traction these days, partly because it flies in the the teeth of what has been a bipartisan consensus of closer ties with Taiwan, partly because of the deteriorating relationship with China. But I think there's been a more fundamental underlying shift, which is there was a time when you could plausibly say that giving up Taiwan would have uh, taken out of the mix a severe irritant and uh, risk of needless crisis and conflict between the U.S. and China. I'm not sure that was ever true, but it might have been at one point. I don't think that's true now. I don't think that yielding on Taiwan would solve the basic U.S.-China relationship as a as a matter of interest. And I think we're in a moment where the values things are are prominent enough uh, that the kind of abandoning a a, uh, a thriving democracy would you know would would have all sorts of problems. Uh, you know, I think we're, we're past the days of the domino theory, but it would it would really make it uh, very difficult uh, to pursue the whole value side of the um, of the uh, U.S. agenda. And the domino theory holds enough uh, credibility, just in the sense that we are in a moment when U.S. alliances um, have come enough into doubt among our alliance partners in the region that I think uh, saying we're reevaluating alliances sounds a little Trumpy. Uh, and a little, a little at risk of of, of of undermining the agenda that's been trying to rebuild those in a way that, as Biden puts it, is a far force multiplier uh, in in, a, in what is at least a semi rivalrous relationship. With so uh, I don't carry a brief for Charlie Glazer, but um, like I said, I did read this yesterday, and I think uh, it does reflect. Uh, Jacques is correct. He wrote a piece about a decade ago, I think, um, calling for the U U.S. to basically sever its ties to Taiwan because that might el eliminate this major irritant. This piece is actually a little different. Um, in this piece, what Charlie is saying is the relationship between the US and China is now locked into rivalry, antagonism, whatever you want to call it. Uh, and what is required given the shifting capabilities between the US and China is the need for the United States to identify its real vital interests and do a better job of protecting them. And that he views the American commitment to Taiwan as one that's likely to both increase the risk of a conflict a military conflict, perhaps, uh, that the United, in which the United States will not be able to prevail at an acceptable cost. And so what he's calling for is the United States to proactively say, no, what we really care about is Japan and South Korea. Uh, those are formal alliances and to strengthen those alliances while the United States announces that it, uh, it is uh, adjusting its relationship with Taiwan and the degree of commitment there. And there are a variety of ways in which this could be uh, managed between the United States and China that Charlie spins out. Um, part of, I think, his argument is, is it better for the United States to perhaps adjust its commitments in the region before it has been forced to adjust them by China? In other words, doing it proactively, or will it be better for the United States to make that adjustment after the fact? 
part of his his argument is based on the resources the U.S. has, you know, to realistically uh, 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 push back against China across the board in the region, or should the United States be more selective? Um, but uh, the question here was whether or not this is a really small minority in uh, the foreign policy community of the United States. Yes, it is definitely a very small minority. It may not be a minority of one, but uh, Charlie's one of the leading spokespeople in this, in, uh, making this argument. Um, and I do think that uh, Jacques is basically correct, that given the domestic political circumstances in the United States, uh, given the likelihood that Americans would anticipate that China would jump on any uh, backing away by the United States and its commitment to Taiwan as evidence that the United States is a declining power that can be pushed around. Uh, I just don't think it's politically realistic to make this happen, even if Charlie Glazer lays out a really very interesting strategic argument. And I think to get back to the book a little bit, you know, Charlie is toward the, this is a real conflict of interest, you know, uh, and less worried about the misperception side. I think there's a misperception element here that, that I would worry about a great deal. We're getting close to the end of our time here. Uh, let me just get a couple more questions in. Uh, from Jerry Rubenstein, we have a question about China's digital Silk, silk Road, uh, <coughs> which includes areas such as 5G, GPS, digital currency. Uh, the, the, this cluster of issues has both economic and security aspects. Is the U.S. imperiled by these and similar issues? Well, we're certainly acting like we're imperiled by it. We're uh, trying to put in our, not only restrictions on what China can do uh, in terms of uh, uh, data and infrastructure in the United States, but we tried to uh, win over some of our uh, wavering partners around the world uh, who may be, for economic reasons, are attracted to the kinds of China, uh, investments that China would make. Um, I think it remains to be seen. And I think this is, a, as the chapter by uh, Elsa Kania and Adam Siegel point out, you know, th these tech areas are going to be very difficult to completely disentangle, but I think it's clear that countries, and it's not really just the, the, the role that China's playing, I think countries around the world are increasingly concerned about um, the openness of the technical infrastructure and the security challenges that can pose in terms of data, privacy, but also uh, narrow security concerns and the ways in which uh, cyber attacks may in fact undermine civilian infrastructure and military infrastructure in other countries. Uh, it's because many countries view China as a potential threat that they're especially worried about the Chinese uh, digital Silk Road. But Jacques? Uh, I, I, I'd agree with that. I think you know, basically what we are seeing is we, we, we tend to use the phrase securitization of economic issues as if it's a you know policy choice and perhaps a questionable one. But I think it, it too is, is, is kind of baked in. That is uh, the idea that everything's going to just compete on price and to some degree on quality is now um, de-emphasized relative to the rising emphasis of the uh, security concerns, which are, which are both economic and, and traditional security uh, concerns. So I think there's a little bit more of, of an appetite for that. But it does run a risk of really getting overheated. And so what the people in the tech space say, and I think this is, is right, although again, defining uh, what falls into what bucket is an issue, but they say uh, small yard high fence. That is, don't try to block off everything. Don't try to keep Huawei out of everything. Don't try to keep every bit of technology from going abroad, but you know, keep in-house those things that are really sensitive and don't export some of those things that are really sensitive and that, that at least that uh, can take some of the temperature down and can avoid uh, needless collateral damage. Um, we're, we're very much up against it here, but I want to throw out at least one last question here, which is the quad. Uh, you know, the Japan, uh, China, I'm oh, sorry, the Japan, US, India, Australia um, um, alignment, as it were, which has been a term that's been kicking around for a long time. We had our first quasi summit of the Quad in an attempt to beef it up as something of a, a pushback against China. Uh, Avery, how significant do you think it is? It's more significant than people thought it was when it was first uh, vetted. Uh, but really, it is uh, so far mostly uh, rhetoric. Uh, it's mostly uh, an announcement of intentions. I don't think it's, it's really been tested yet. I mean, I think the real question for many of these things, and I noticed another question we won't get to, is what about the, uh, the competing idea of the Blue Dot Initiative and, uh, for the, as a way to compete with China and the BRI, and, uh, including members of the Quad being involved? You know, these are all big think uh, responses to what China is doing. But so far, at least, uh, you know, where the rubber meets the road, where you look at actions rather than announcements and, and, uh, and ideas, the level of investment on the part of the United States and some of these countries has been insufficient. Now, maybe that's going to change and maybe the quad itself will emerge as, as China fears it will emerge as kind of an uh, kind of a, a Asian version of NATO. Uh, 
uh, confronting China on security issues. That may happen. It hasn't happened yet. Uh, I will say that uh, just as I pointed out before in the United States, there's this view about what China does will be in part shaped by what the US does. I think the tightness of the quad, the reality of the quad doing practical things, uh, and the reality of things like the Blue Dot Initiative, uh, th that these programs uh, will be affected and how seriously they are, are taken by leaders in uh, the various participant countries will be shaped by how much they view China's challenge as increasing, that that will determine the closeness of uh, cooperation among the Quad members. Uh, Jacques, I guess you got the last word. I do, which is I, I, I second all that and to weave those uh, last few questions together as Avery quite ably did. I just say one of the, the things that I think has started to take firmer footing in U.S. policy discourse here is that this is an asymmetrical contest in a variety of ways. The U.S. is never going to go toe to toe on BRI. We don't do construction on that scale. You know, these are there. You have to find different tactics within the same policy space. Uh, and I think some some of the, the stuff that we've seen coming out, perhaps Blue, Blue Dot and others, uh, increasingly um, uh, recognize uh, that, and that's all to the good. Uh, but we are past our time. I want to thank my colleague, Avery Goldstein, my colleague at, at Penn and at, this, at our center, and, and in this and other books, uh, for joining us today. I want to thank everybody in the audience uh, for uh, sticking with us through this and for your questions. I'm sorry we weren't able to get in greater detail to all of them. And I'll close uh, again by saying uh, thank you for joining us. Please come to other FPRI programs, including the one we're doing on the Taiwan book on May 4th. We'll have others coming up as well. And uh, as uh, Raleigh tells me, I must do it. She's absolutely right about this, uh, to encourage you to join FPRI uh, and uh, to become a contributor because, as she says, these are free to you, not free to us, and we like the lights on. Uh, so thank you all for your interest and your support.